lot of scripture to cover. Okay, this morning? So, if you would, if you would, go ahead and get some paper out. If you've got something to, to scribble on, I, I am really going to cover a lot of ground. Um, remembering last week, yeah, I do have the text if you want it. Um, I can give it to you so that you have it to go back through. Um, everything that I'm really going to be uh, speaking on this morning is going to be uh, from a site. The, the uh, minister's name is Mark Blitz. And um, he is, really his teaching is amazing. What's his last name? Blitz. B-L-I-T-Z. So if you were to Google Blood Moon on YouTube, actually I do it on YouTube because it's easier. It'll come up, and there's several that come up, but look for the one that, um, when you click on it, it's Mark Blitz. And he covers so much more than what I'm even going to cover this morning because he's really the expert. And the reason that I wanted to go over this, honestly and truthfully, when we were first born again, and we were learning scripture, when we were learning about God, we read several things by a minister, or a, a rabbi, Zola Levin. And we were so excited because it was like the scripture became alive to us. And we could see all of the things and understand all the things that Jesus was talking about. I mean, after all, he's a Jew, right? He's Jewish. He grew up. So everything he spoke about was from those teachings that he learned as a child. We know from Scripture that everything in the Old Testament is pointing towards Jesus. Everything there is pointing to his coming, of who he really is. And everything in the, in the New Testament goes back to Jesus, tells about everything that he did while he was here on earth. So today what we're going to be looking at is we're going to be laying another layer on the scripture that we talked about last week. The, if you remember the video that was played, this is just going to be another layer on top of what we talked about with the blood moons. So, signs in the heaven. We looked um, at Genesis is going to be one of the main scriptures that we're going to be going back and forth to. We're going to be Genesis chapter 1. If you look at Isaiah 46.10, it tells us that declaring the end and the result from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel will stand and I will do all my pleasure and purpose. That's God speaking. If we want to know what's going to happen at the end, he's been declaring it from the very beginning of time. From the very beginning. So Genesis chapter 1 verse 14 says this. And remember, we're looking at the signs in the heavens. Okay? Then God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. And let them be signs for seasons and for days and for years. Now in our Greek mind, we're thinking, well, okay, God created the sun and the moon to give us light and heat during the day, keep us warm, and the, of course the moon was there at night. But there's so much more to this. The word sign in the Hebrew is oat. And the definition for this particular word is signal, distinguishing mark, banner, warning. So when we look at this, that he set the lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night and to let them be for signs. Not necessarily that is to give us the light and all that good stuff and the heat, which it does, but those, the sun and the moon were put there as signs for us. So, in Isaiah, I'm sorry, yeah, Isaiah chapter 13, verse 9 and 10, it says, Behold, the day of the Lord is coming, fierce 
with wrath and raging anger to make the land and the whole earth a, desolate, a desolation and to destroy out of its sinners. For the stars of the heaven and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be darkened and at its rising and the moon will not shed its light. It's talking about the signs that the sun and the moon, and remember, this is all on the blood moons. Okay, something's going to happen. Those were put there for our signal, as a sign for something to come. In Joel chapter 3, verse 15, it says, The sun and the moon are darkened, and the stars withdraw their shining. We look again at Luke chapter 21. So now we're going to go in the New Testament, not just the Old Testament, but the New Testament. Luke chapter 21, verse 25 says this. And there will be signs in the sun and moon and stars, and upon the earth there will be distress, trouble and anguish of nations, in bewilderment and perplexity, at the roaring of the tossing of the sea. Signs in the sun and the moon and the stars upon the earth. Something's going to happen. We need to watch what these things are going on. Now this year, if you remember from last week, we talked about the fact that 2014 and 2015, there has not been this kind of a signal where we've got two blood moons, then a full eclipse, and two more blood moons. So there's going to be two, uh, the blood moons uh, at Passover and October this year. And then um, there's going to be the eclipse, 2015, and two more blood moons on Passover. And in October for uh, Feast of Trumpets, I believe. Okay, so there's something that's going to happen. And if you look back in history, we're going to cover some of these events. If you look back in history, what took place when this happened? Now, we have to get out of our Greek mindset and our Greek calendar and look at what God is saying at his calendar, his timetable. After all, we were grafted into the vine. <coughs> he set those things for us so that we could see and learn and understand. It's all going to pull together. Luke chapter 12, verse 56 says this. You play actors. Jesus is talking what to? The hypocrites, right? You hypocrites. You know intelligently, okay, because the Pharisees were all taught certain things. They knew the feasts. They knew what was going on. They knew the signs of different things. So you know to discern and interpret and prove the looks of the earth and sky. But how is it that you do not know how to discern and interpret and apply the proof to this present time? They knew, they understood, they had a knowledge of scripture, but they didn't apply it to what they were actually seeing. In Jeremiah, Chapter 8, verse 7, it says this. Yes, the stork in the heavens knows her appointed times of migration. And the turtle dove, the swallow, and the crane observe the time of their return. And God said, but my people do not know the law of the Lord. They don't recognize it. They don't pay attention to it. Okay? Now, in um, Ecclesiastes, and we've all heard this, there is an appointed time for everything, and there is a time for every event under heaven. So let me ask you the question, what time is it? Have we paid any attention? I haven't paid attention to this for a long, long time. And I remember when I was studying these different things, and the, 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 really the Holy Spirit was quickening to my spirit. <gasps> That's what he was talking about. <gasps> I see it. We're going to look at some of that stuff. 
Okay, so the first thing in Genesis chapter 1, verse 14, is it talks about the sun and the moon were put there for signs. But then it also talks about seasons. Now, automatically we think, <coughs> summer, spring, fall, winter. Winter, spring, summer, fall. Right? There's a song about that? All right, we think of the seasons. But that's not what we're talking about. If you go back and look exactly at what the Hebrew word is, it's moed. And it means appointed time or meeting. The four feast. So sometimes in two different places, in Genesis it says seasons, but if you go to Leviticus chapter 23, verse 2, they translated this word moed as feast. Now that does not mean turkey dinner, Thanksgiving feast. It's not the food that you go to. There's a place that we uh, fondly refer to as the trough. We used to go to in Jacksonville, North Carolina, and that's Golden Corral, you know, all you can eat, one price, right? It's not talking about feasting and stuffing yourselves, okay? This is a divine appointment. So those divine appointments, if you think about those divine appointments, those feasts, those seasons, as it were, Passover, Unleavened Bread, First Fruit, Shavuot, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Tabernacles, all of those different appointed times, those divine appointments that God the Father put in place, meeting places, so, if you could say in modern times, God has a day timer. And I might even say he has um, an, an iPhone that has the calendar in it so that he can put that event in there and invite all of us. Okay? And we all get it. Same thing, day timer, if you remember those. So, God has set these appointments, which means what? He's going to show up. Right? If you're in, in, in work... Right? And your boss sets an appointment. You've got this conference call that you have to be on. At this particular time, he's going to be there. She's going to be there no matter what and expects you to be there because something's going to happen. God, the Father, has set divine appointments for us. Passover, unleavened bread, first fruit, Shavuot. I might be saying it wrong. Okay, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and Tabernacles. He set all of those things in place. He is going to be there, and if he makes an appointment, he's going to be there. And he's going to show up in a very, very special way. Those feasts of the Lord, they're not just Jewish feasts. Okay? The feasts of the Lord. Because when you look at scripture, it's referred to as the feasts of the Lord. So we have to get out of our Greek thinking that those are only for the Jews. That's not the case. These are the feasts of the Lord. And if we belong to the Lord, they are for us too. Amen? Amen. 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 Okay. So... All of the inhabitants, in Revelation, in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, it says this. And all of the inhabitants of the earth will fall down in adoration and pay him homage. Everyone whose name has not been recorded in the book of the Lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. And I want, I, I highlighted that, from the foundation of the world. God, remember that when he started, that God knew from the very beginning of time what was going to take place. So we know that Jesus was slain from the very foundation of the world. If you want to know the end, he's been declaring it from the very beginning. So what that means is that the Father knew the exact year, the exact month, the exact day, the exact hour when Jesus would die. He knew it all. 
Mark Blitz even refers to the fact that he even had the songs picked out for his service. That's how detailed our Father God is. Nothing happens just because. He didn't come to that point and say, oh my gosh, Jesus has died. What's plan B? Okay, he, he, no, he knew what he needed to do. Genesis chapter 1, verse 14. And let them be for signs and seasons. Paul, talking to the church in, in Thessalonica, says this. But as to the suitable times and the precise seasons and dates, brethren, you have no necessity for anything being written to you. So what's that saying? You already know what's going on. Now, this is what I want to point out because, I mean, this is a, a, this is a conversation that we have had back and forth and back and forth about the feast. Okay? Do we celebrate? Do we not celebrate? Are we supposed to? Are we not? Paul only said that you, all they had to do was, you know, don't add anything to the Gentiles, you know, just don't drink blood, and, you know, there's just a couple things that he listed. But Paul is speaking to who? A Greek church. Thessalonica was not a Jewish church. It was not in Jerusalem. Paul was the messenger, the apostle to the Greeks, right? So he's saying here to these people, you already know, so what can we presume from that? That they have been taught about the feasts. Not that you have to, you know, because we've, we've been released from the law, so to speak. But you already know these things. You've already been acquainted with them. So why does he say that? Because they knew those seasons. Now, if you go down just a couple more verses out of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 2 through 5, it says this. For you yourselves know perfectly well that the day of the return of the Lord will come as unexpectedly and suddenly as a thief in the night. When people are saying, all is well and secure, and there is a place and safety, then in a moment, unforeseen destruction will come upon them as suddenly as labor pains come upon a woman with child. And they shall by no means escape, for there will be no escape. Circle this but right here. But you are not given in darkness. You are not given in darkness, brethren, for that day to overtake you by surprise like a thief. What's he telling them? You see the signs. You know the times. So when it's talking about the thief in the night, we need to remember who are they addressing. They're not addressing believers because believers already know the signs of the times. They already see the seasons going on, right? I mean, that's what he's saying here. But you are not in darkness, brethren, for that day to take you by surprise like a thief. Thief. Thank you. He is speaking when he says the thief in the night. He's speaking to those uh, Laodicean church people in Revelation. He's talking to the lukewarm church that would not recognize. He's talking even possibly to the ten virgins because there were ten virgins. Five of them knew and were ready, and five of them weren't. He's talking to people who don't recognize, don't listen, don't look at those signs and seasons that God, Father God, put in place for us. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 through 18, Jesus says this, Do not think that I have come to do away with or undo the law of the prophets. I have come not to do away with or undo, but to complete and fulfill them. For I truly tell you, until the sky and earth pass away and perish, not one smallest letter nor one little hook will pass from the law until all things are accomplished. Now, why did I bring that in? Because when I was listening to all of these things that, when I was listening to Mark Blitz on, on YouTube, I thought, oh, 
that's the scripture. That answers this conversation kind of back and forth that we have been having, do we, don't we? What about this, and how do we do that, and, uh, and how are we supposed to include all of this? You know, Do we celebrate the feast? Do we not? Do we observe them? How do we do this? Because we've been told that Jesus came to fulfill the law. I said that earlier, right? Did you catch it? That he came to fulfill it. So no longer do we have to follow it. Well, we don't have to follow it. Not the law, but those feasts were part of it. The feasts were to point to Jesus coming the first time. And we're going to look at it. It points to him coming the second time. Okay? We're on the wrong calendar. We're on a Greek calendar. All right? Let's go back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 14. Right? Let them. What's that let them refer to? It refers to the sun and the moon. Let them be a sign of the times and the seasons, right? So the calendar that we are on, this modern pagan calendar, is what? Do you know what it's called? It's a Julian calendar. It was created by a Roman ruler, right? A Greek, somebody who set it up, but it's on what? It's established on only the sun. Okay, if you look at the Muslim calendar, it's set up only on the moon. So if you were to look at a watch, have you ever seen those fancy watches that has the one main uh, timepiece and then it has two other timepieces? One of them is for maybe overseas somewhere or whatever, I mean it's on different things. We're not worried about the, the Julian calendar or that Julian timepiece. We're not worried about the Muslim moon timepiece or calendar. We're concerned with God's timetable and his calendar, which was set up on the sun and the moon. And if you listen to Mark Woods, he can give you all those little details. Like I said, I'm not the expert. But it opened my eyes because you know how that with our calendar, we have to add every four years, we have to add a day. In the Muslim calendar, they don't. It just kind of, when they, their, their celebrations just jump all over the place. They never repeat themselves in a certain particular time frame. But God's calendar, they add a year, or they add a month at one point, and that, that, that's considered the year of Jubilee. Mm -hmm. You can get those details in another place, okay? But Passover always falls at the same time. First fruits always falls. On this, a lunar solar calendar. Okay? So, jumping forward. Signs in the heavens. Signs of the times. Matthew chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. The Magi understood the signs. They knew. They were watching the stars. We're talking about astronomy, not astrology. Astro uh, astrology is all about me. Astronomy is all about him. Okay? So the Magi were watching the stars. They were watching the things that were going on. And it says in verse 1 and 2 of Matthew chapter 2, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men, astrologers, from the east came to Jerusalem, asking, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east at its rising and have come to worship him. If, a couple years ago, we went to a museum in Milwaukee, and they were playing, um, I forget what the title of it was, but they had all of this information about this, the skies at the time when Jesus was born. Okay, so if you look at the sun, the moon, and comets, those are all signs. There was a comet which signified something significant was going on. And that's what they saw in the sky. And they followed it. Just a little drop in your, your thinker. Comet Ison. Did anybody hear about it? 
in November 2013. Huge comet wasn't going to necessarily come real close to the Earth, but it was so significant. Look it up. Google it. Comet Ison, I-S-O-N. It was so big that you could see it. It's signaling a warning. Something's happening. Something's coming. Look out. Okay? So, we talked about uh, the Magi. They saw his star. Let's, and in Psalm 104, verse 19, it says, The Lord appointed the moon for the seasons. The sun knows the exact time of its setting. So you could say that, well, do we control how the moon operates when the, when the blood moons are going to come or when the eclipses are going to happen? We don't control any of that. God does. I am not standing here before you today saying this is going to happen right now. I don't have a specific, I really don't have a specific date. But I'm telling you, the way things are lining up, it makes me jump in my spirit. Of what's going on. That's, you know, when I sang that song, I mean, that's a really old song, people get ready. But I'm telling you, things are lining up. We need to be ready. We need to be knowledgeable of what's going on in the heavens, of what we see. So um, it also says in Leviticus, we looked at Leviticus chapter 23, verse 2. It says, Say to the Israelites, the set feasts for appointed seasons of the Lord, which you shall proclaim as holy convocations. Even my set feasts are these. God is laying these out. These are the feasts of the Lord, the festivals, the feasts of the Lord. Passover, we went over them. It's not the Jewish people's feasts. Again, these are just supporting scripture verses going over the fact that these were established by him. By God himself. Exodus chapter 12 verse 11 says, And you shall eat it thus, talking about the Passover, as fully prepared for a journey, your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. Highlight. It is the Lord's Passover. It's his. It belongs to him. His appointed time. His divine appointment that he's invited us to. He sent us all invites. We have them sitting in our mailboxes right now. On our calendars. Colossians chapter 2 verse 17 says this. Such things are only the shadow underlying highlight this are only the shadow of things that are to come. And they have only a symbolic value. But the reality, the substance the Amplified has, the solid fact of what is foreshadowed, the actual body of it, belongs to the Lord. So Paul is even teaching here that all of those things are there, but they are foreshadowing. They are talking about something that is to come. In Hebrews chapter 1, or chapter 10, verse 1, also says again, For since the law has merely a root outline foreshadowing, you can underline that, of the good things to come, talking about these are pointing us to Jesus. These are supposed to keep our eyes focused on him. The feasts of the Lord. Let's go back to Leviticus chapter 23, verse 2. It says, Say to the Israelites, the set feasts or appointed seasons of the Lord, which you shall proclaim as holy convocations. Holy means what? Set apart. Convocation. It means assembly. In the Hebrew, the word is mikwa. So a convocation, a holy, a set-apart assembly. Which, if you think about it, there was assembly when you were in high school. Were you expected to attend? Yes. When there's, a, when there's an assembly for work, a conference call, a meeting, 
You're expected. It's set apart. That time is blocked. I have several of them on my calendar. I have to make conference calls all the time that people have to come, and they are expected to be there. It's an appointed time. So God is telling us that these were set apart assemblies, even my set feasts. Let's talk about this. Think about a wedding, and we just got done doing a wedding in August, okay? And everything was set apart, but you, as you got closer and closer, you made sure all certain things were taken care of, and then there was the rehearsal dinner. If you've ever been in a drama, been a part of a play or a production, there's always a dress rehearsal. So, with that being said, in light of the feasts foreshadowing things to come, they are meant to be a dress rehearsal for us, right? So I want you to think about this. God told the children of Israel for Passover that they were supposed to do certain things, and at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, what were they supposed to do? They were supposed to offer up the sacrifice. They were supposed to slay the lamb. At that moment, specifically, so all of those years that they were celebrating Passover and going through what God told them to do, it was a dress rehearsal for what Jesus did. I want you to think back in Scripture that what it says. What time did Jesus die? Exactly, Jenna. Three o'clock in the afternoon. That gives me goosebumps. Three o'clock in the afternoon. God has every detail laid out for us. There is a dress rehearsal going on to prepare. Now, have you ever been involved preparing for a very special guest to come? Whether it was the client at work coming in or you were going to have a special speaker. I mean, we've done that here at church. You know, everything's got to be ready. you got to have this. you got to have that. And you prepare so that everything is ready for that big day. Go back to the idea about the wedding. You are trying to get everything in place so that it's perfect. Dress rehearsal. So if the spring festivals represent the first coming, which they do, that is what the fall festivals represent. What do you think? First three represent, the first spring festivals represent his first coming when Jesus came, was crucified, right? The second set of feasts, the fall feasts, are pointing towards his second coming. Yom Kippur, the Feast of Trumpets. I'm sorry, Yom Torah is the Feast of Trumpets. Yom Kippur is the Day of Atonement. Sukrat, Feast of Tabernacles. Here's an interesting little fact that we may not know if you've never studied this particular thing out. I was never raised to celebrate those feasts. Think about this dress rehearsal. The Feast of Trumpets blow, they were told to blow the shofar 100 times. And the last one, the last blast is known as, can you guess? The last trump. What scripture verse pops up into your head? Immediately, I thought about Paul in 1 Thessalonians. Chapter 4, 3 through 18, says this. But we do not want you to be uninformed, some say ignorant. We don't want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who fall asleep, so that you will not grieve as the rest of us who have no, or as the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with them those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this 
we say to you by the word of the Lord that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not receive those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord. <coughs> Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Did you see that? The trump of God. Feast of trumpets. Could be the rapture of the church. That's what that's referring to. The last trump. Hebrews 13.8 says this, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, is always what? The same yesterday, today, forever. For the ages to come, forever and always. If he is the same, yesterday, today, and forever, and he fulfilled the first three feasts, the spring feast, if he fulfilled that with his first coming, and he never changes, could we then go down and say that he's going to fulfill the last three as well? With his second coming? Just saying. Could possibly be. I think it is because God doesn't put things there by accident. Nothing is haphazard. He doesn't say, What's plan B? From the foundations of the world, he's had this planned out. In, in Revelation, again, Revelation chapter 13, verse 8 says this, And all the inhabitants of the earth will fall down in adoration and pay homage, everyone whose name has not been recorded in the book of life of the Lamb that was slain in sacrifice from the foundations of the world. Our Father has set the signs in the heavens to signal us, to warn his kids. He wants to warn us. He wants us to see it. He put it there for a specific reason so that we would be ready. Thus says the Lord of hosts in Zechariah 8, 19. The fast of the... Now this is, it gets really interesting and gosh, I'm almost done. I promise. And I only said that once. I got about this much more to go. No. <laughs> the Lord says this in Zechariah. Okay, now this is where it really gets interesting. And my heart just kept going, oh, oh my gosh. Oh, look at that. That's amazing. Zechariah chapter 8, verse 19. Thus says the Lord of hosts that the fast of the fourth month, and these are talking about fasts, the fast of the fourth month and the fast of the fifth, the fast of the seventh and the fast of the tenth shall be to the house of Judah times of joy and gladness and cheerful appointed seasons. Therefore, in order that this may happen to you as the condition of fulfilling the promise, love, truth, and peace. So those four fasts were to actually become festivals, a celebration. If you look at the word, it's, it's very similar to the same one as the feasts, the divine appointments that God had set forth. Now get this. <coughs> We're going to jump to Nebuchadnezzar. We're going to look at history. Nebuchadnezzar in the 10th, on the 10th of the 10th month, surrounded Jerusalem. 17, on the 17th of the 4th month, he broke through the walls. On the 9th of the 5th month, the temple was destroyed. And on the 2nd, of the seventh month, Gad Gadaliah was killed. He was the governor that was put in place. Okay. Now, all of these things that I talked about, it was the tenth month, because when you look at a year, and where I'm going to use this as an example, October, for instance, is the tenth month. But then you have November, December, January, and you start a new year. So the way that these feasts or these fasts were set up was it started at this point in the 10th month, then the new year came. And then, so Nebuchadnezzar surrounded 
broke through, the temple was destroyed, and then the governor was killed. Okay? So, let's look at history because we all were told in history that the reason it was important is that history always repeats itself, right? Not to put us asleep when we were in school, but actually because history does repeat itself, okay? Get this. What happened on these feast days? Why were they so significant? On the 17th of the fourth month is when the children of Israel worshipped the golden calf when they were in the wilderness. What happened on the 17th day of the fourth month? Nebuchadnezzar broke through the walls. In 70 AD, Rome broke through the walls. In 2007, Lebanon was at war with Israel, and missiles were flying over those walls. Because they had worshipped the calf, the golden calf, the 17th day of the fourth month was cursed. The ninth of the fifth month is the day the spies brought the bad report. Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the city on that day. 70 AD, Rome destroyed the city. In 1290, the Jews were kicked out of, the, out of England. 1492, the Jews were kicked out of Spain. On that same day, World War I started. In 2005, Israel evacuated the Gaza Strip, giving away the promised land on that day. If we look back in history, you go to NASA's website, you can see the lunar eclipses. They're set up from way back, okay? This cycle of blood moons that we're going to be in, 2014 and 2015, will not happen again for 100 years. Something significant is going to happen. In Psalm 102, verse 16 and verse 18, it says, <coughs> When the Lord builds up Zion, he will appear in his glory. And then verse 18 says, let this be recorded for the generation yet unborn, that people yet to be created shall praise the Lord. When did the Lord build up Zion? In 1967. They went back. He built them up. Generation here, this word, me is, is hakaran, hakaran. And it means terminal or final generation. When you put all of these calendars and you look at all of these things, a generation, we've kind of been told was 40 years, but it's, it runs 50 years when you look at the calendars, the way that it's laid out. And I mentioned the star, the comet Isom. That's a signal. That happened in November last year. So what I'm saying is people get ready. We need to be about our Father's business. We need to pay attention to his words and what he set out for us. Study it. I'm not the expert. Pull that up. I am telling you that God set this calendar, these divine appointments, for a reason. If he was so specific to tell the children of Israel 
to sacrifice the lamb at 3 o'clock in the afternoon and was so specific that on these special days, the 9th, the 17th, you know, all those things, that certain things happened, something significant is going to come to pass. Amen. The country looking for the Messiah. Do you think they were fearful? Do you think they were scared? I think they were anticipating seeing this king. They brought gifts, think about it, gold and frankincense and myrrh. They were excited. So I think as a church, I think it's good that the Spirit of God is given to us so we can question and examine ourselves and see if we're ready. I think that's important. But I think we should have we, we should, should be joyful and exciting, excited to know that someday soon, again, like Tina said, we're not making a prediction, we're just looking at the signs, that Jesus could return. Amen? And there's so much more that we're going to share probably next week about these different dates and the events that are happening now in the world. Uh, again, we're not experts, but we do believe that it's important that you understand and that we understand that we are not on the Greek calendar. We are on the, on the uh, if you will, a Jewish calendar. And the year this year is actually uh, 5,774, which has a significant meaning to it. If you look it up, look it up for yourself. Uh, uh, because I don't want to scare you, I want you to just understand that all this is for a purpose that we recognize that God is real and that God sent His Son to bring salvation to the world. Amen? And uh, the, the law, if you will, is a schoolmaster to those that don't believe. So that's what the law was for. So we can understand things about God. God is never hiding himself from us. He's always revealing himself to us. Amen? And I believe that we need to focus, I believe in these last days, on what our mission is for God, kingdom of God, and not so much about what we have to do for ourselves. Can you say amen? Come on. This is real. This is real stuff. So what are the blood moons for you that weren't here last week? We have one that's coming up on um, uh, this year, on April 15th, which is Passover. Amen. Hallelujah. This fall, uh, the Feast of Tabernacles, and it repeats itself in 2015. In the middle is a, a complete uh, solar eclipse. It's only happened four other times in the history that NASA has been recording it. And this is one of them. So something's going to happen. Amen? See, well, I don't really believe that yet, Pastor. You don't have to believe me. Just study it for the Word. <coughs> I'm not really sure about all that. That's fine. Study it. The feasts are for a sign for us to understand about Jesus. Amen? And so this year, uh, we're going to celebrate Passover. Actually, it's kind of interesting this year because Passover winds up on a Tuesday. And so the Sunday before Passover, since we meet on Sunday, we're going to celebrate a Passover service here. And then we'll have our regular Easter service the week later on the 20th. And we'll invite all the unsaved and all those people that call Easter, Easter. And uh, when they really don't, they don't understand the meaning of that. We're not going to give out candy and little peeps and all that chocolate stuff. That's all pagan. So this year we are going to concentrate on celebrating the feast as a church family. I don't know what that will look like yet. Is that okay? But I know on the Feast of Trumpets, 33 times... Three different times the, the, the shofar is going to be blowing. And the last time, it's going to be blowing for a long time. Amen? And we're going to do that right here in our church service. I can't wait for that because I don't know how to blow the shofar, so I'll have to get somebody else to do that. But why is it? Because we're announcing Jesus. Amen? And like Tina said, it's a rehearsal. It's like getting ready. Be prepared. Amen? Don't wait. It like uh, and, and, and the understanding, as so many people have missed quoted or misread those verses. Jesus come as a thief in a night. No, for us that believe, we're like the virgins. We're oil ready and we're waiting for him to come back. We're excited about him coming back. Amen? Let's stand together and I want to pray a uh, prayer of blessing over you. Richard, will you hear my Bible right there? Hallelujah. Jesus gave us the whole, you know I love teaching on the Holy Spirit. Jesus gave us the Holy Spirit 
to bring us to full knowledge of Christ, amen? To be a paraclete, the one that come alongside us, the one to teach us. So it's not, we're not supposed to be fearful. We're not, this is not hidden information that we're teaching you today. We're just bringing it to you because we feel like we failed teaching you in the past. Amen? I think that if we would have taught, when we were just new believers, and somebody gave us a little booklet from Zola Levitz called The Feast of Israel, and we read that, oh, we understood the gospel. We understood what Jesus, what, why Jesus came. He was a sacrificial lamb. We didn't know that. I didn't learn that in my religious background. I never was taught that. But when I read that little booklet about the feast, and I put it together, that Jesus, on the, on the very hour that they sacrificed that little lamb, Jesus died at that moment for us. That's amazing to me. He put it all together. And we've been searching the scriptures since. And I think now we need to get back to our roots a little bit. We have to teach the truth of God's word. Remember, somebody told me this the other day. I'm going to pray a blessing over you that it's in, uh, out of number six. But like the woman at the well, Jesus said you need to worship me in spirit and truth. You remember that? And the woman said, well, you know, I'm he said, I'm gonna, Jesus said, I'm going to give you some water that you're going to drink of. You're never going to thirst again. Where should I worship on this mountain? Or should I worship on this mountain? Jesus didn't answer that question, but we know he was saying this is the right mountain. But he so said to her, he says, I want you to worship. I want you to worship in spirit. I want you to worship in truth. Now, we have the spirit of worship, but sometimes we don't have the full truth. Amen? And the truth is found in Scripture. And as we follow these feasts, it will, you will not go wrong. Amen? You will not go wrong. All right? Praise the Lord. Let me let me just pray this over you. This is what uh, God's, if you will, Moses told uh, that he would, the priests are supposed to pray over the children of Israel. And I'm going to pray this over you. Most of you probably already know this. And as soon as I start, you'll, you'll recognize. And I'll, I will teach on this in about three weeks. But I want to just pray it over you. It says, the Lord bless you. Close your eyes, please. The Lord bless you, and the Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Give you peace. The Lord give you peace today in the name of Jesus. Father, I pray for your divine peace over this congregation, Lord. Not to be fearful about what's going to happen, but to anticipate, as the young versions did, with our oil ready and our lamps ready for your return. Father, I give you thanks. In Jesus' precious name, <coughs> amen. Amen. Let's give him praise. Come on. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. We love you, Lord. Hallelujah. We love you. So let me share with you just a little bit. Uh, this, is, this is extra. You can turn it on.